Hello, Agroecology 103 students. My name is Erwin Goldman, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Horticulture. I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes here about crop domestication and the beginnings of agriculture. And for me, one of the best ways to think about what uh, domestication and modern agriculture uh, look like is to examine this painting by Thomas Hart Benton which is called The Emergence of Agriculture. Well, it's called Wheat, but it appears in a book called The Emergence of Agriculture. And you can see a couple of key things in this painting that I think really describe uh, the domestication process. If you look closely, one of the things you'll see is the incredible uniformity of the grains of wheat, the heads of the wheat plant in this picture. You see that they're so similar in height. And this is a feature of modern breeding and modern agriculture so that this field can be easily and efficiently harvested by a machine. Another thing that's really obvious compared to uh, a stand of natural plants is that all of these plants are maturing at the same time. This, this is also a kind of uniformity that is characteristic of our agriculture. These plants were bred to have a very similar or identical maturity so that the field can be harvested all at once. Another thing you'll notice is the regularity of the spacing. And these plants are obviously grown in rows, which is something that doesn't happen in nature, and they're grown in rows for various reasons. For one, they were planted by a machine, they're going to be harvested by a machine, and we can carefully control the conditions in the field, whether we're controlling pests or diseases, whether we're controlling weeds, by driving a tractor down the field in between those rows. And so you can see that spacing. And then finally, one of the things that I notice about this painting is that very few of the heads are bending down. We call it lodging uh, in, in crop agriculture. Lodging would be the way that a plant would lie down on the ground or fall towards the ground compared to standing up. And you see the, the fact that all these plants with their heavy grain at the top are still standing up is another characteristic of something that you would see in, in agriculture compared to uh, nature. So I think wheat does a good job of, of giving us some of the clues to domesticated crops. It's interesting to think about what our crops go through in their trajectory from wild to domesticated. Um, obviously, the picture in the upper left is a domesticated watermelon, and this painting is, oh, I don't know, maybe this painting might be a century old, for example. But even there, you see the, the, the black seeds that are present in the watermelon. You also see the, the whiteness in the interior. You can compare that, if you want, to Wayne Thiebaud's uh, art um, showing the, these beautiful sort of mid-century, mid-20th century watermelons on plates. You see some of the black seeds there, but by now the modern watermelon in the lower right is a seedless watermelon, and it's got very, very solid red flesh throughout. Now, this is a product of, of agriculture. It's also a product of breeding and genetics, and really represents a continuation of the domestication of this fruit. So what you know today as the watermelon is seedless. What your parents and grandparents probably knew of the watermelon was a very seeded form and the crop continues to evolve through time. And this is one of the most important points that I wanna make here is that our crops evolve continuously. They're continually being domesticated. And if, if you wanna say it this way, the work that we do in plant breeding today is just the current phase of crop evolution. It's just what we're doing today to make our crops different. Who knows what they'll look like 50, 100, 200 years from now. So what is crop domestication and how does crop evolution work? Well, we, we, we might say that the breeding of crops, the, the you know selection and changing their genetics is simply a definition like changing the genetics of the population over time for our needs and wants. This is a definition that is, um, I think, really workable. Just simply means that we, we modify the genetic, uh, you could say the frequencies of genes and populations over time for the traits that we're interested in. 
that's breeding itself. It's very closely related to domestication because domestication involves breeding and selection. Domestication is actually through that process we take a population and it becomes entirely accustomed to our control. So we are in essence moving it from the wild into a cultivated setting and almost always our direct selection is the most uh, predominant feature although the the plants will also change frequencies of genes that are associated with with natural selection and natural predators and pests as well so when we're talking about evolution we're talking about genetic change in the population over time that's the simplest way i can describe it and so domestication is is the start of that process and a continuing cause of crop evolution because we're continuing to modify our plants all the time as we breed them to fit new agricultural situations, to fit new human needs and wants, to fit new markets. I think humans have been looking at this for even before agriculture started more than 10,000 years ago. Uh, we find cave paintings of animals. Clearly people thought about domesticating plants and animals and this process of identifying animals and then bringing them into cultivation where humans lived really represents the, the act of domestication. Some plants were very likely domesticated for religious reasons, uh, for building materials, uh, for medicines, but probably most of them um, had multiple purposes for their domestication. They were used for many things but uh, food was probably the most primary in most in many cases. Jack Harlan, who's one of the one of the famous scientists who worked in this area, ag argues that that people who were hunting and gathering had all the knowledge they needed to conduct farming, but they actually waited a long time before they started to farm. And he has these wonderful examples of uh, interviews with people who were in hunting and gathering communities, even even into the 20th century, who said, you know why should I farm when I can when I can uh, hunt and gather all the things that I need, and of course, setting up an agricultural system means a lot more work, and it means a very organized work schedule throughout the year that can be extremely time-consuming and laborious, and lots of hands are needed. Um, so it 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 is not as though agriculture and the domestication of our crops into these fields and, and agricultural settings is something that is universally recognized as being superior to hunting and gathering, but it certainly has its advantages in being able to support very, very large populations that were essentially sedentary compared to those situations where the populations were nomadic. Harlan also says that many crops have diffuse origins. They, they evolved over time as they spread to new regions. So yes, there may have been selection from wild to cultivated in Central Asia, but that crop may have also moved into the Mediterranean where different selection pressures were placed on it. An example of that would be onions and garlic, which are some of the crops that I work on. Onions and garlic were originally domesticated in the mountains of uh, the area around Afghanistan and Kazakhstan and Tajikistan in that area. And there were certainly selection pressures there that people placed on them. And then they, as they moved into the Middle East, into the Mediterranean, into civilizations like ancient Egypt, different selection pressures occurred. And Harlan says that our crops, you know, we, we, we can't say that there's one model by which they evolved. He, he calls it the no model model. And he says, you know, our crops, are, uh, they, they arose and were domesticated in very different settings, depending on the people, depending on their culture, depending on their motives and practices. And so we can't say that there's one model of humans turning wild plants into cultivated plants. But we can say that that domestication is the change in the plant from a wild state to a cultivated state. Uh, it's the best way to, that I can define it. And interestingly, it makes the plant in, unable to survive in the wild. And so it is entirely dependent then for its reproduction and its survival on us. Uh, and you could, you know, if you want to think about your pet dogs and cats uh, who are entirely dependent on us or largely dependent on us for their survival. It's the same thing, right? We, our plants then will need us in order to go through their life cycle. And it, it results in very large changes, phenotypic changes and genotypic changes from the wild populations.
it's interesting that there are examples of domestication that are quite short. And there are some examples, uh, although these are not necessarily, uh, these are hypotheses that are uh, testable hypotheses, that some grasses may have been domesticated in as short a period of time as just several hundred years. And I do think it's entirely possible that uh, a period of time like that could be enough to domesticate certain plants. The earliest cases of domestication probably go back 10 to 12,000 years ago. Uh, around 10,000 years ago, we have examples of crops like lentil and, and cucurbits, which are the squashes and the, and the gourds and the cucumbers, uh, wheat, uh, phaseolus, which is the genus for, for the common bean. Many of these were, were being domesticated uh, in that early period. And then there's another uh, period, let's say about 5,000 years ago, in which we see the domestication of crops like soybean in Asia, sugarcane in the tropics, uh, sorghum, and uh, rice. And then there are some very modern uh, crop examples of things like oil palm, rubber, forage grasses, and even sugar beet. But these are somewhat deceptive in a certain way in that the sugar beet is a very modern crop. It was developed only, uh, let's say, two or 300 years ago in Europe, but it was developed from previously existing crops. And so in essence, uh, humanity has built on some of its early domesticates to make new domesticates. One of the most important figures in uh, crop domestication is Nikolai Vavilov, or Vavilov, Russian botanist, who was really a hero uh, in genetics and plant biogeography. Uh, he, he worked uh, in the early part of the 20th century, and he worked in, uh, in Russia, and he defined the major centers of origin of our crops, which are depicted on this map. These would be the places in the world where humanity domesticated a large number of our crop species. It's not to say that everything was domesticated in these eight centers, but these are the eight most important regions of the world where crops were domesticated. And you'll notice that there are none in North America. There is a major center in Mexico, which is center number one. And then there's a major center uh, on the western coast of South America, the northwest coast of South America. And those are the two American centers. Uh, center three uh, is in Central Asia. This is the one I mentioned earlier. And there are centers that go all the way into uh, China. Um, so if, if you were interested in the origin of a particular crop, you might first ask the question, what is its center of origin? What part of the world was it originally domesticated? Because those two things correspond. This is the place where it was probably originally domesticated by humans. And importantly, this would be the part of the world where it would have the greatest amount of genetic variability in the wild. Um, because humans, as they began to select, create lots of variation. And this is a place that we can hopefully still visit in the world to find useful genetic variants for our crop. And by that I mean, if I was interested in breeding onion, I might go to Central Asia and look for wild relatives of the onion that I could use in my breeding program. This slide shows you some of the crops that were domesticated in some of the different regions of the world. Um, and so the Central Asian center that I mentioned was, a, was where uh, onions and garlic were domesticated, but also the, the carrot, uh, apples came from there, almonds came from there. Uh, the Mediterranean, we have celery and cauliflower, cabbage. Um, we have oats. Uh, we have the parsnip. And then if you look at North America, even though North America doesn't have its own sort of formal center of origin, you see a few crops. Uh, the muscadine grape, the sunflower, the Jerusalem artichoke, and the cranberry. But of course, most of our crops, I think it's important to say, uh, that we depend on in North America had to have been originally domesticated somewhere else, perhaps the first instance of a truly global uh, food system. And I am grateful every day, every morning actually, when I wake up for the Ethiopian people who domesticated coffee. And, you know, how they figured out that these cherries, these coffee cherries that you see in the upper left-hand part of this slide could be fermented and then roasted and then steeped to produce coffee is beyond me. What a brilliant invention, in my opinion, certainly deserving of the Nobel Prize. 
but this invention uh, you know obviously made its way around the world and even though we can't grow coffee in every part of the world yet it is a plant that grows uh, t- tends to grow at high elevations in warmer climates uh, it is a, a brilliant act of domestication the British uh, were it, because of their strong colonial tendencies and their strong navy were great appreciators of the domesticated plants around the world and this is a celebration <clears throat> the queen celebrating uh, the uh, anniversary of Kew Gardens in England Kew Gardens was a botanic garden that was very important in collecting the domesticated plants from around the world to preserve them, to study them, to maintain them, but also to figure out how they could be used. And so, you know, if you if you had a great navy, you could explore the world, bring back seeds and cuttings and propagules of different plants, and you could uh, study them. And this was one of the things that, that England did at the Royal Botanic Gardens. Michael Pollan, uh, who's somebody that is worth reading if you, if you aren't familiar with him, he's a brilliant writer. And in a book called The Botany of Desire, he asked the question, who domesticated whom? He says, through trial and error, these plant species have found that the best way to do that, that is to, you know, to reproduce, is to induce animals, bees or people, it hardly matters, to spread their genes. How? By playing on the animal's desires, conscious and otherwise. The flowers and the spuds that manage to do this most effectively are the ones that get to be fruitful and multiply. So the question arose in my mind that day, did I choose to plant these potatoes or did the potato make me do it? And I think this is a brilliant way of thinking about the world, whether it did the, you know, are the plants so captivating to us that we will then do their bidding and literally multiply their seed for them? Um, or are we in charge of this operation? And do we have the ultimate control? And I suppose both sides of this are true. I suppose just like our domesticated pets, whom we find so fantastic that we are willing to do anything to, uh, you know, to support them, um, in a way they, that guarantees their survival. And I suppose the plants that, uh, like coffee maybe, uh, were so important to us that we were basically willing to do anything to propagate them. Well, one of the things that you'll note about domesticated plants is the tremendous variation in, uh, in traits that are interesting to humans. This is one of the key features of domesticated plants. You probably would not see this kind of variation in seed coat patterning in wild populations of common bean, but you do see this kind of variation in seed coat patterning in cultivated bean because humans like the patterns on the seed coats. And so we tend to collect and preserve that variation that you can see here. So we, we uh, again, Jack Harlan, who I mentioned earlier, said the part of the plant that is of greatest interest to, uh, to humans is the part that is modified the most. So from a wild Brassica oleracea plant growing on the seacoast of the Mediterranean, you can see that on the left there, we get people selecting for uh, different kinds of different kinds of uh, floral buds that makes broccoli. Different kinds of curd. This is not even. This is like a pre-floral bud. That's uh, cauliflower. People selecting for different variations in leaves. They make the collard greens. The kohlrabi is a, a swollen hypocotyl. Uh, the the Brussels sprout is a ter- uh, is a lateral bud. The cabbage is a terminal bud. In each of these crop cases we've selected for enormous amounts of variation in the product that we wanted to eat. Uh, and so you can find hundreds of different varieties of broccoli and you can find hundreds of different varieties of cabbage because we've collected and preserved and selected all of these different types. We've modified this single Brassica oleracea plant into seven different vegetables, which is just incredible, really, if you think about it, but that's what humans do. They ramify uh, this plant into all sorts of different variants, and then we use it for, uh, for all sorts of different purposes. Charles Darwin uh, wrote about this very process. 
And he called it variation under domestication, which I, in many ways I think is an even better definition of what we're talking about. And he wrote a two-volume work called Variation Under Domestication in 1868. And he said that the domesticated forms actually vary more than their wild progenitors because humans preserve these slight variations. And then the most variation is found in the characters that we want, such as the seed coat pattern of the beans. And we then select those into different varieties and we preserve the varieties. And so we've got essentially a, a huge collection of different phenotypes that represent the species. Darwin said in one of his writings here in the book, it may be that a gooseberry larger than the London variety will not be produced, but he would be a bold man who would assert that the extreme limit in these respects has been finally attained. What he was talking about here is, you know, you see this berry and you think, my goodness, it's so large, you know, how is this crazy? How could it ever get larger? But in fact, you know, humans continue to push the envelope. They continue to select new types. And ultimately we do. We continue to create larger and, and more uh, interesting variations that we preserve. So what traits are, are most important in crop evolution? Well, you know, obviously in the, in, we're interested in, in things that we can eat, um, although not exclusively. We're interested in medicine and fiber, but, but we're definitely interested in things you can eat. And I think this slide uh, from John Dobley's laboratory in the Department of Genetics here uh, at our university is, is one of the greatest illustrations of the difference between wild and domesticated. It's teosinte, wild corn on the left, and an air of Argentinian popcorn, one of the very early forms of corn on the right. And you can see a couple of things very clearly. One is these just giant kernels that are much more uh, palatable. They're soft compared to the really hard kernels on the left that you would break your teeth on. And then the fact that those kernels are just, you can just pluck them right off the ear, right? So this is, you know, beautifully illustrates uh, uh, what humans selected for in a, in a food source. Here are some seeds. Uh, the left panel has uh, domesticated seeds on the right and wild seeds on the left. And you can see those seeds are larger. Humans selected for the size of the seed. They selected for, you know, there's two row barley and six row barley. They selected for six row barley. These were mutations that gave them more grain per head of the barley plant. And then if you look at the panel on the right, you'll see a domesticated quinopode. Uh, this is uh, something related to, say, uh, amaranth or quinoa uh, on the left versus a wild version on the right. And so the domesticated has a lot more seed and a very concentrated uh, seed set compared to the more open form on the right. One of the, one of the most remarkable characteristics of the transition from wild to cultivated is the trait we call shattering. Shattering is when the seeds would simply fall to the ground when they were ripe, which is how the plant would normally reproduce itself. But in agriculture, we would like those seeds to stay on the plant so that we can harvest the plant whenever we want. And the, the, the trait of naturally falling to the ground is shattering. Humans selected for non-shattering types. So the rachis, which is the part of the flower that holds the kernel, holds the grain on the plant, is, is the wild rachis is pictured on the left. The cultivated rachis is pictured on the right. And this comes from the Sudan 2,500 years ago. The cultivated rachis is this big structure that holds that grain, holds that kernel on the plant so that it can't fall off so that we can come in and harvest it when we want. And I think this is what is just such a fascinating feature of crop evolution that it, it um, that we can, we can select for things that will make it possible for us to harvest when we want, the non-shattering type. And people believe that that non-shattering gene had a single origin, and in the case of rice anyway, was fixed in the population during a period of perhaps 100 years. So that as people found a mutation that kept the rice grain on the plant, they preserved and selected that to the point that in one century that became the dominant type of rice that was cultivated in Asia. So the non-shattering habit is, is one characteristic. Uh, people selected for reduced plant size and determinate growth, shorter life cycles, 
reduced dormancy, less branching. Uh, they selected for altered uh, photo periods and altered vernalization requirements. They selected for reductions in astringency and bitterness and defensive compounds so that the plants were more palatable, colors and, and shapes that they liked. These are all things that you might imagine would be part of what humans would want, and humans modified their plants to suit that purpose. The two probably best examples are in corn. One of them is the gene that I talked about earlier, which turns the hard fruit of the teosinte, that really rock hard fruit, into this open kernel that's pictured on the top right. And there, that's a gene that's widely known. That gene is called teosinte gloom architecture, or TGA1, and it has been modified through, through domestication and selection to make this big, beautiful kernel that is not lignified, it doesn't have a lot of hard lignin in it. And it's a, it's a regulatory gene that makes the, the kernel just stand up and be very edible. Another gene is called TBA1 or teosinte branched and it converted the wild corn, which is pictured on the left and looks a little bit like a candelabra, into a single, uh, single stalk with one big ear. That's teosinte branched architecture and of course, Teosinte branched architecture is the is is the that change is what we have in modern corn. We we don't have a candelabra plant. We've got this single stalk that can be planted at very high density with produces one huge ear. And what that gene did was simply repress the growth of those lateral branches to make for that single eared plant. Another great example in corn is that corn originated in Mexico and is a short day plant for flowering. So it's used to flowering under, under short days, but it spread around the whole world. It grows here in Wisconsin where we have very, very long days in the summer, 16 hour days compared to say 12 hour days in Mexico. And it turns out that there is a single gene, it's called ZMCCT, that has a huge effect on the ability of that plant to flower under different day lengths. And it appears now we can look back at the, at the genes of corn during its domestication and we can say that humans were selecting for corn plants that could flower in more northern locations as the plant moved out of Mexico. So it moved into Texas and then it moved into the central part of the United States. And now it's grown all the way through northern Canada. What we were really selecting for were variants of the gene ZMCCT, which allowed for the plant to spread very far north and very far south. So even though ZMCCT was present in Teosinte, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't a gene that was very functional in Teosinte, but as we domesticated corn, we were selecting, you know, without of course knowing about this gene, we were simply selecting for plants that would survive in a very uh, northern and southern environment, uh, this allowed for the north-south spread of maize, which is really just incredible. Uh, and so we, we now understand that plants have a plasticity to them that allowed for some of this domestication. Well, I'd like to finish by just mentioning something about breeding after domestication, because once the crops are bred, or excuse me, once they're domesticated, we then begin our process of breeding. And this this, this uh, panel, I think, does a really nice job describing that. It has the picture I showed you of the teosinte at the left. That's the domestication. Then humans begin to select for the, 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 the desirable genes that they want, whether it's colors or textures or flavors or non-shattering habit. Then they begin to make varieties. They basically make, you know, you can see in that figure you've made, you know, separate varieties that have separate purposes or can grow in different areas. And then finally, stage four, which is where we're at today in modern times for the last, probably the last 125 years, is very deliberate breeding where we're gonna cross this plant with this plant or A by B or B by C in order to get a desired outcome. And that's that deliberate breeding is, is characterizing our modern uh, stage of crop evolution. Another thing we do, of course, is we've selected for new uses of these plants that weren't even dreamed of 125 years ago. And here is the difference between corn just in the years 2005 and 2010. In 2005, 12% of our corn was going for ethanol. 
In 2010, 34% of our corn was going for ethanol. It means we were basically selecting corn for a totally different purpose to make fuel that we had never dreamed of when corn was domesticated, or even five years before that. So it is really interesting to see what we might turn our crops into uses that we have never even conceived of. I'll conclude with this slide. The World Summit on Food Security has said that we need 70% more food by the year 2050. And that increase means 44 million metric tons on an annual basis, which is a huge increase over even historical increases that we've been able to affect through breeding and, and, and improved cultural practices. We're going to have to sustain that for 40 years in order to feed the growing population of the world. So it may involve, I mean, it will certainly involve improving the efficiency of our breeding, but maybe it will even involve domesticating some new crops that can help feed the world. Thank you.